Konnichiwa. Hariyo. I'm Leslie. I'm Laurie. Welcome to Sumo Kaboom. Sumo Kaboom. Where we talk about all things sumo. Yep. And this week, we are following our own little noses of curiosity. Sometimes you just got to do this. That's right. When you're doing a weekly show, you just got to follow your own curiosity. And That's this time, right. it led to underdogs and unions. Yeah. I mean, the whole reason I got this idea is that one of our listeners, Kay, sent along this Wikipedia page that was like, did you know about this incident? This is pretty fascinating. And upon reading about it, I was like, yeah, this is kind of interesting. So I wanted to tell you all about a, a little interesting tidbit of sumo history you may not know about. Let's do a news flash. I actually don't have much news except for our very own Kellyanne Ball continued her winning streak. She went to Saudi Arabia, and if you had not heard of her greatness. She won the bronze individual and then team gold, uh, bronze medal at the Sumo Worlds. And then like the next week or so got on another plane or two weeks later back to Saudi Arabia. So she was in Tokyo and then she's back home and then back to Saudi Arabia for the World Combat Games. And she won the silver medal in heavyweight women's. She's on a roll. Yeah, that is like, she's breaking all kinds of records, making America look incredible. And uh, so congratulations, Kellyanne Ball. We're excited about whatever comes in, in the future. And to all of our other competitors, we are so excited at just the momentum as of late. It's been such a fun journey. So congrats to everyone who's crushing it, everyone who's continuing to practice at home, everyone who is competing or who is not competing yet, but who wants to, we are on your side and we are cheering you on the whole way. And I'm watching all of your posts on Facebook and on Instagram. Like, look at me training. We see all those Keiko. We see all the Shiko. We are behind you 100%. And just congratulations for being able to travel and represent the United States. And we're your fans. And we're really happy for you. Whether you come home with a medal or not, just well done for going out there and giving it your all. That's right. That is kind of all I got as far as news goes. I mean, the world of pro sumo, we're kind of in that lull where they're just like low on the news and they're like, Ted and Afuji has now been out for two tournaments. And we're like, yep, information we all know. People are practicing. Nothing huge is really happening unless I missed stuff. But there's always good stuff on social media, which I always appreciate. There's always random videos. And I think we're just kind of in that period where we're just watching random videos of sumo wrestlers on the daily. And that's the kind of the yeah, news yeah, yeah. that we're It's kind of how my life has been lately. I just know. kind of in between jobs, just experiencing the lull between <laughs> the high of the Basho, exactly. you know? Yeah, everybody, you need it. So that is all for the news. Shall we jump into our main segment? I'm really excited to hear the story. I don't know anything about this. Okay. Well, I will probably mess some of this up because it was a little bit confusing because I got a bunch of good information from the Japanese translated version, Wikipedia. And then like the English one had good stuff that was easier to comprehend. But I was like, I know I'm missing something in here. So if but you are wondering, you can always just like Google this title of this incident in time in the sumo world and just like read up about it because it's fascinating. And tell me again where this idea came from. One of our listeners, Kay, who sent it along, who's big up into the sumo world and fandom and is always sending like really interesting things and always sending like cool clips too of like Makushita and people on the rise. And I'm always getting a good solid look at the sumo world through Kay. So that's amazing. So uh, Kay sent this along and I was like, I think this is really in interesting. Okay, I'll start with the title, The Shunjuen Incident. Ooh, now, it sounds like a great film. It does. It does. And if you'll notice, that is not a Japanese word, really. It's oh, it's a not? It's a Chinese word. Because mm. this incident, one of the main locales, if, you were, if this was a movie, was a Chinese restaurant. Oh, okay. So it takes place in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> in Tokyo. In Tokyo. Yes. Ooh, okay. I one, like this. One part of it. So on January 6th, 1932. Just a few short years ago. Just a few short years ago. A little before my time, this one is. A little bit. 
It was known also as the Tenru Incident because Tenru was a wrestler at the time. Okay. And before I go into the incident, I want to give you a little bit of a background on who kind of the main guy, the main instigator of this was. Okay. If it were a movie, <laughs> would this be a documentary? Okay. It, it's a little bit, it, it's nothing sad, but I guess it could be dramatized in some sort of like hyper action film kind of way. Oh, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Um, we'll see afterwards. You can you can lay it out as you see it in a Hollywood script. Okay. okay. He was born Saburo Wakuta in Shizuoka Prefecture in uh, 1903. So it was a long time ago. Okay. Now, he was, I guess, I guess he's the third son. And I did not know this, but if you are a big boy, obviously... The word gets out that you're a big boy. And in the world of sumo, in those days, they were like, uh, one of the oyakatas got word that there's some big kids up in uh, Shizuoka. <laughs> Actually, it's translated as there are some mysterious children up in Shizuoka. This is, this is before the Chinese restaurant. Yes, so this way is... before the Chinese okay. restaurant. This got is it, just it. about the instigator, Tenru. Okay. Okay. So... He grew up uh, like the third son of, I don't know what his parents did, but apparently when you're the third son and you're very big, you, because of Japanese customs, are not allowed to go to junior high school. But he was very Wait, studious. What? I know. Don't ask me. That's what the translation said. I don't, this is what I said. I explained. There's going to be parts of this going to be like, what the hell? But back third, then, third, the third born son, large children couldn't go to Not large, school. just the third born son does not get to continue on school. Oh, it had nothing to do with his size. No. Just no. because he's third born. Yeah, the okay. others have to take after, I'm sure, the shop or whatever. And then he or he has to he has to work. The other two inherit everything, I'm sure. And and get their education. And get their but education. He does, he does not. He's just a big kid. And it's sad because he was really studious. Okay? He was a good student, right? Okay. So about that time, Oyakata's up in Tokyo were like, I've heard mysterious there's mysterious children. I've heard there's some mysterious ch children in Shizuoka Prefecture. Okay. That's Let's check this check out. Check out these mysterious Word on children. the street is there's a big kid. So he sends a letter that says, hey, big kid, would you like to join the sumo world? Now, I don't know if he knew that this was like the third boy that was like, he's got no options in life. Have him come. He's another mouth to feed. Have him come to sumo. And he was like, no, I don't want to do that. Well, I like to study. I like to study. And then like another year goes by and the Oyakata was like, ah, I am going to go get this mysterious child of, of Shizuoka Prefecture and tell him personally how I feel. He's got to join sumo. He's a big kid. And so that seemed to work. And so he then came up to Tokyo and his father on the train platform was like, I am disowning you. You should have joined the military and uh, you were dead to me. Wait, what? Yes. So this was like, I'm not going to send you to school. You need to go into the military. If you're not a soldier, I'm never speaking to you again. Yes. Yes, okay. that's what the Japanese there must be Wikipedia something cultural, I culturally. Culturally, we do exactly, but okay. I'm sure it had to do with you know Japanese pride. And I mean, this was uh, he was born in 1903. This was were there this, wars going on? Yeah, I mean, this would have been around after World War One. You know, you serve in the army, you serve now. Pride and national pride is is everything to you. So apparently, his dad was not happy about it. He's dead to him. So he's like, fine, I'll go up. And I'll go to Tokyo and be a sumo wrestler. Now, mind you, he was not very good when he came up to, well, to do... he'd never done it before. He'd never done it before. He was a studious kid. Right. Who ate and a lot. so they assigned him to a Yokozuna. He was tall and lanky and clumsy. They assigned him to Yokozuna to do all of his letter writing because okay. he had excellent calligraphy. Okay, great. Good I, handwriting. He had, This kid had great handwriting. Good penmanship can get you far. It can get you far in life. The problem was, and this is what made me giggle, he was so good at it and spending so much time writing... The Yokozuna's letters that he wasn't getting enough practice in. Then the Oyakata was like, well, this kid is real crappy at sumo. I'm going to assign him to be my assistant and I will control the amount of time he spends writing letters and then he can practice. And once that happened, he was assigned as to write, I don't know, the letters for the Dewanaumi stable. He was able to practice more and he got better and he got better and he got better. He debuted in pro sumo May 19. 20. So he was 17, 17, perhaps years old, 17 or 18 years old. So he did pretty good. It took him a while to get up in the ranks, but not forever. He did make it up to Sekiwake and eventually made it to Ozeki. 
But here's the thing. At the time, you know how it is controversial if if a komosubi gets bumped up to ozeki? It, it's not normal that a komosubi wouldn't go straight to sekiwake and then okay. go further. He, this other guy got bumped up and became an Ozeki. And he was six years younger than him. He was one of his juniors. And he got the Ozeki promotion before he did. And so he, a younger kid yeah. became Ozeki before Tenru Ten, yeah. with the fantastic pen Calligraphy. Chip. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, and he was pissed. And he was pissed. They say, the reason why said, I say this. you're dead to me. Well, the reason why I say this is that it's alluded to that that is possibly the reason why this incident at the incident Chinese happened, restaurant happened. <laughs> is that okay. he was a little miffed. Okay. So, in uh, he became a Sekewake in 1930. It was in 1932, January 6th, right after the Bansuke came out. And he decides all of a sudden that the Sumo Association has not been treating the wrestlers very fairly. And this is true. At this point in history, the wrestlers had lived in a system where they had come in usually as young kids, and it had been somewhat corrupted at the at the time. The wrestlers were in a real pinch. They were higher ups, and the JSA had no money. They also knew that the Oyakatas were lining their pockets with what the wrestlers should have been given. So at that point, the, the world that we know, the monetary system in which we know now, did not exist then. So some of these wrestlers were giving everything, their health, their everything, and they had no retirement. They had nothing like this. So Tenru, being the scholarly kind of guy, got together with about 20 guys in the Ichiman, his same Ichiman, and said, let's all meet at this Chinese restaurant, okay, in Tokyo. Okay. I got to talk to you about how unjust the system is for us. We're giving everything and we don't have any money at the end of the day. Where is it going? There was no transparency of their winnings, where it was going. They just knew they didn't have much coming to them. So 20 guys showed up and they were like, you're right. You're absolutely right. Now, these weren't just any guys in sumo. There were 20 guys who were Sekitori, Jurio and Makauchi, and I think a Makushita wrestler. And they all agreed with him and they said, okay, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go on strike. That's a sumo what, strike. Sumo strike. And it was huge news. So what happened then was the JSA at the time called the Greater Japanese Association of Sumo or something. The, it's basically the JSA or NH, NSK said, okay, okay, we'll negotiate. We'll negotiate. And then they negotiated, but not fairly. They basically were like half-assed with their negotiations. And the wrestlers said in 48 hours... If we're not negotiating and, and, if, and if you do not agree to our terms, we're going to cut our top knots off and we are all going to retire from sumo. That's more than half of us are going to be mm-hmm. out. You're going to be left with Makushida and below. So you tell us if you want to negotiate. Well, apparently the JSA played hardball. Yeah, they bluffed. They were like, yeah. mm, no, they're going to bluff. And so That's what I meant. these 20 guys, plus one Makushida, who's still a guy, he's just not <laughs> okay. Okay. got together and said, fine. And then 10 other guys joined in. So now they're up to 30. So now they're up to 30, 31, 32, something like that. And they, they had been kind of on the out you know, on the sidelines going, what's going to happen? Because oh, they're talking with their friends now and they're like, what? What is this deal? What's right. happening? Right. And they're serious about it. What? We so, should have retirement. We could do that. Right. I'm like, and nothing's checking out. There's no transparency. So they're like, I agree. So they all get together. They get their little white pieces of paper out and ceremoniously all cut their top knots off, put it in this white piece of paper that says, I officially retire. Oh. And they go to the Issei shrine, I think, and they deliver that to the JSA and say, suckers, we're out of here, bitches. And the JSA was like, okay, um, I guess we have to cancel the upcoming tournament. And so they're not happy, but they're still hardline. They're like, okay, well, we'll get our shit together and we'll figure out and we'll move up some guys from Makushita. Well, they move up a whole bunch of guys and like soldier on, including... One of the guys they moved up in this incident was in Makushita, was the great Futabayama. And he got a pass like all the way up to Jurio from wherever he was dwindling down in Makushita. He got a big old pass straight up to Jurio or, or Makauchi. And they, remind us who Futabayama is. What, he's like the 35th Yokozuna and one of the greatest of all times. So anyway, the 
striking wrestlers go, fine, if you're going to do that, well, we're going to have our own tournament and we're going to call it East and West. And we're all going to meet in Tokyo in this outdoor arena type tented thing. And we're going to have a wildly popular sumo tournament and we're going to have our own sumo association. And I can't remember the name of it, but they did. And they publicized all of this. There's one report that said uh, Tenru was hanging out of a, pl- of a of a plane, dropping 10,000 leaflets amongst the crowds below to, to, to announce and publicize that this big tournament was happening. And public sympathy was on their side. Mm-hmm. So this was well attended. The problem was They continued to operate for a while, and the JSA continued to operate in their broken system with no transparency with the guys who were like, I don't have the courage to leave, you know? Mm -hmm. And they just kept on keeping on. And the other guys, because they had their top knots cut, the crowds were kind of like, oh, this kind of isn't as exciting as the old tournaments with just because of the lack of top knot not that but the the excitement faded in time and one of the reasons was it didn't have the pageantry that you know that traditional sumo maybe had with the top knots it just maybe didn't look the same Hmm. but this group kept going and they tried their best but just like anything eventually in time it kind of faded out. And that was like by 1937. And so I'll tell you what happened with these demands. And and let me read you some of these demands, though, because even though the JSA back then did not agree to any of these, eventually in time, they did. Here are some of the demands. One was establishing an auditing system for the whole sumo association to make public the revenues received and expenses used. So up to that point, wrestlers would win something, but they wouldn't necessarily know how much their winnings were and how they were allocated and how they were spent. Given back to the Oyakata, how much goes back to the wrestlers that, that are in his stable, they didn't know that. Yeah, this seems like a very simple demand. Right. They changed the Basho scheduling hours to conduct the summer Basho in the evening. Up to that point, I guess it had maybe been in the heat of the day. Okay. And they wanted that to be at night. That seems like reasonable. Legit. Yeah. Lower entrance fees. Because up to this point, Sumo had all this reserve seating for elite people. And the general public had no access unless they could afford these seats. And they knew that to grow the sport, you have to have more general admission seats. Um, abolishing the tea house system. You know how all a lot of the tickets for those ground seats in the boxes are sold by the tea houses? Mm. In the old days, these t- tea houses were oftentimes either owned or in partnership with an oyakata. So makes sense. The oyakata would line his pockets from the proceeds from these expensive box seats, and then nobody else could see it. So it was abolished at the time and brought back, like in the seventies. Like Hmm. they did, they got rid of it and then brought it back. They wanted to eliminate the, the elder system, the Oyakata, you know, how everyone can retire and then become an Oyakata or if they have, yeah, why they want to retire that? Because they assume at the time they actually didn't understand. um, They had no knowledge of how the system worked. So they wanted to abolish a, a system in which they didn't understand how it worked. And so I think that, the Toshiori system or the Oyakata system, the elder system was kind of, again, another thing that they couldn't look into as a, as a wrestler. They didn't see how the inner workings of it and how everyone could work up the system within yeah. the retirement system. It wasn't clear to them. So they were just like, we'd like to abolish that because you're not telling us what happens. All these committees and all this other stuff who def- decides our fate, what, how does that work? Well, and why don't we know about it? It sounds like they're fighting against a system in which the Oyakatas are, uh, own all the power and all the money. Right. So, yeah, of course they'd want to abolish that at the time. Exactly. And share the earnings. Exactly. Number six, they wanted to uh, have basically an annuity for wrestlers. Some sort of... Retirement? Yeah. Right. And that's exactly what they have today. Or are you saying just a salary? Well, it says annuity, but that I kind of read that as a salary, but also perhaps the retirement as well, Okay, which both they have today. Increase wrestlers' income while maintaining their living standards. That's eight. So that's kind of maybe that first one means retirement. This meant a traditional salary that was livable, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And then nine was better the association's excessive numbers of employees. 
from what I read, there was a lot of redundancy. So they'd have a bunch of extra guys working in the association and they wouldn't know what their purpose was. So all of these... Were they wearing blue jackets and standing <laughs> in the in the Hanamichi? Well, that's a legit... That's a legit <laughs> security dude, but... I imagine if you're like, why are there eight guys in here on payroll and we don't know who they are, what they do. They're not a wrestler. This like, is like construction where it's like one yeah. guy's working and eight guys are watching. Exactly. <laughs> well, and that's why the system was so unclear to them. They were like, we don't know. We're getting the earnings. Yeah. And then there's all this murky stuff. Please explain it. And then lastly, establish a wrestler's association based on a mutual aid system. So I don't exactly know. Wait, it. say that again slowly. Establish a wrestler's association based on a mutual aid system. A system that benefits us or aids us, like in terms of health? Are they asking for some sort of health care or? I don't know. It doesn't okay. say health care. It just says mutual aid. Mutual aid. Yeah. So, But they, they wanted to also improve the, the touring system, you know, just basic, basically. Like it's not good for us. They're just like show ponies. And they can't earn money enough to feed their families or themselves. There is even an instance in which a Yokozuna or some of these high-ranking wrestlers had no money that they got paid to, to wash the backs of some of their supporters in a bath. Like, make a little extra money. You can have a Yokozuna give you a bath and wash you down, and they'll they'll take well, money for it. I will say that would be popular. Uh, right? <laughs> it would be a He's popular like, fundraiser. He's like, I'm desperate to make but- I, yeah, I don't think that's right. Just to be clear, no, that's not the best way to make your income if you're anyone, anyone. Right. And here's another incident that might give light into how the JSA was operating. A few years before this incident happened in the Chinese restaurant um, or started the in the meeting, Chinese, the, the meeting, meeting was the, the meeting. Chinese I like I like the drama of the Chinese restaurant. Like it all happened there, but it didn't. That was just the original meeting. Yeah. There was a vendor who had to file for bankruptcy because he had supplied all of the kimonos to all of the wrestlers. And the JSA was like, oh, we just don't have those payments. We're not going to pay you. Yeah. And that guy had to file bankruptcy. And the JSA was like, we just don't have money. And so, <laughs> hmm. so how do wrestlers survive? I mean, it was that bad. So... Yeah, so everything was taking place behind closed doors and no one knew where the money was going. Exactly. So what it sounds like. Exactly. Yeah. After this other sumo association kind of died out, this guy, Tenru, went to Manchuria. This is another little fun tidbit. And Manchuria was Japan-occupied northeastern China, borders with Mongolia. And he took all of his sumo expertise and built up somewhat of the Manchurian... Candidate? Yeah, a candidate, a number of candidates, if you will, Manchurian sumo. Interesting. Which made me go, is that why? Like, I mean, not that Mongolians are wrestlers. They've had that tradition forever, the boke wrestling. But why there would be that connection with mainland China or Manchuria at this time and, and it sumo. was at a Chinese restaurant. Right? Was he part Chinese? Mm-mm. Nope, not at all. He was eventually invited back to Japan. And he eventually, get this, came back into the sumo world of the JSA. All of these things had been in- implemented and improved upon. He was, uh, he became an elder and a well-respected member of the JSA. You're kidding. No. They invited him back in after he, all that and said, you were right? Yeah. Come back well, in? he was a smart guy. He even became a sumo commentator and he was well-beloved. And wow. he was total boss. And he died in like 80-something or 80, he died Whoa. in 89 at the age of 85. Whoa. And maintained his life in sumo for many years. After that. Isn't, that. isn't that crazy? It came yeah. back. But I guess, you know, all of those old fuddy-duddies had either died out or the system had changed enough. And then he had benefited, the, the rules and all of this had benefited enough wrestlers who probably became elders. Uh, all these guys came, a lot of them after this tour, they came back into the Sumo Association. They allowed some of these guys that had hmm. been striking. They allowed some of them back. Some rather quickly came back and some a little bit longer, but they had all come back. So perhaps that's why he had open arms when he did come back to Japan. Interesting. To join. Interesting. Yeah. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. And remind me right here at the end again what the name of this incident is. One of the names. Dun, dun, dun. The Shunjuen incident. S-H-U-N-J-U-E-N incident. 
Oh, uh, here did I tell you this? That the whole reason that they were at the Chinese restaurant, it was one of his patrons or sponsors. Okay. But they wanted to debut a line of new dishes called the Genghis Khan dishes. <laughs> Well, and they were there's like, no better way to do it than to invite a whole bunch of sumo wrestlers into your restaurant and get photos of them eating right. your new dishes. Right. They're just they're lining up a little strike here, but also they might be eating some of our new yeah. line of dishes, the the Genghis Khan or Genghis Khan yeah. dishes. And we'll be telling everyone in the neighborhood that you enjoyed them. No matter what comes of your meeting, did you enjoy the new the new balls, the new well, rice actually, balls? Actually, it's a Japanese yakiniku oh. dish that has um, mutton in it. Lamb. You can did have you other you can have other meats, but okay. this one is the at the time they're Grilled like lamb. let's promote our new lamb dish, and they can have this meeting on the side. Free meeting on the side. Interesting. Yeah, really interesting. Okay, so I suppose in today's episode we're talking about the power. The power of the underdog, in a way. Power of somebody who's not at the top of the system, but who's lower down in the system. Right? Right. Maybe. I mean, my incident was in 1932. Is yours more recent? My, You know what? Mine, I am jumping off of what happened at the last Bosch show. Oh, so modern day. Modern day. When we got to the last day and we were going to have a playoff match between our Ozeki, our one Ozeki, and a guy who's at the very top of the Sumo Pyramid, if you will, because we did not have a Yokozuna in play at the last Basho, and a guy at the very bottom of that pyramid at the highest level. So the guy in last place and the guy in first place were meeting together to see who was going to win. And it seemed to me, I mean, there's a lot of Ozeki fans out there, but it also seems to me that there were a lot of people hoping for the little tomato to win a Tommy Fuji. <laughs> so I just thought, okay, am I am I just like making things up or does it is it really is there such a thing as the underdog effect? Do we all really love underdogs? And so that is the question that I sort of jumped off the diving board with today. And uh, there is such a thing as the underdog effect. And I think it's hilarious that there are people out there that actually study underdogs wow. and why we all love them. Because uh, we do. We all love them. And we especially love them in sports. Uh, let me give you one example. Um, these two researchers in 1991 published a paper on the underdog concept in sport, and they posed a really simple scenario to a whole bunch of college students. And they said, okay, guys, gals, college students, we got two, two teams here, two sports teams in play. We got team A, we got team B. They're meeting in a best of seven playoff series. All right. So imagine it's the world of baseball. Okay. You got to get... You you have to get four out of the seven in which to go on, okay? So they're like, Team A is a highly favored team. They're really favored to win. Team B, not so much. Which, which team would you root for? 81% of those college students said they would absolutely root for Team B, the underdog. Wow. Not the ones that are highly favored. And so then they came back to the students and they asked later, okay, now imagine that somehow Team B has managed to win the first three games of the series. Now we're to game four. Who are you going to root for now? And most of them, over half of them who said that they would pick the underdog mm -hmm. said, now I'm going to support Team A. Oh, I, root, yeah. root, root for the loser. No matter what. Okay. And that is the underdog effect. I we, agree with that. Like I, right? I as, a re, as, a, as a watcher of sports, am always cheering on the underdog or the person who does not look mean. Yes. And <laughs> when I went, when I was looking at this um, information, you know, these sort of like social, social studies, it was amazing to me how many movies were quoted uh, as having this underdog effect well, and how many of those movies we have continuously talked about on this podcast. Well, Rudy. We, exactly. 
Rocky, <laughs> Rudy. Like there's so many. And Bridget and Jones. I mean. Absolutely. I don't know. Actually, I don't, she. Yeah. No, she's an underdog. She's she must, totally. She's totally the underdog. Yeah. 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 Because we just you and me. We love the underdog, and it's universal. I think a lot of people in the world love, 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 love the underdog. Merely framing someone or a team as an underdog makes us more likely to root for it. And it's kind of odd in a world where strength is celebrated, weakness is looked down upon. We so often end up rooting for a Tommy Fuji. Right. Not Takake Show. Right. <laughs> So, <laughs> well, one is cuter than the other. I mean, they're both they're, cute. They're both cute. They're both I mean, cute. And they're both smiling, but you just don't see Takakesho smiling as much as Atami Fuji is smiling. That is very true. Even though the hamster is adorable. Yeah. I mean, from I the mean, backside yeah. is extremely adorable. So, <laughs> well, I front side, back side, side side, above, below, they're just all cute. Let's just let's just say they're all cute. <laughs> and fierce. Yeah. But I want, so I was like, okay, why, 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 why? I wanted to look at these studies. Why, 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 why are we all into rooting for the Atami Fujis of the world, the Tokushoryus of the world? Or the Tenrus of the world. The Tenrus of the The guy who's like, it's just me against this giant it's of me an associ- machine. association. That's and the right. public came to his defense. They okay. were like, you're right. Yes. So there are several ideas. Several different people have studied this, but there are several ideas about what's in play here when we're rooting for the underdog. One is we absolutely identify with the underdog. We like underdogs because we personally know how it feels to have all the odds stacked against us. And it. we know how it feels when other people seem to be getting things easy. We identify with the underdog struggle, their passion, their drive to push forward despite being disadvantaged, despite being powerless. The Tenrus who are like, I'm not even that, I'm not even an Ozeki, but I am going to change this system, right? The underdog persists through difficult times and then succeeds, and it gives us reassurance that we can make our mark on the world too. We relate, right? We absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And companies do this all the time. Like in the world of business, if a company can like, has a, if a company has a brand in which they're like, we're the little guy mm-hmm. against the big wide world, right. people will buy that product more. If we believe that story, if we're like, oh, Steve Jobs started Apple in his garage all by himself. It was him and one friend that like that is the story that their brand puts out Well, that's out there. our story. We're just the wee little sumo gals. In a closet. In a closet. In Texas. I've never even seen sumo live. Sumo elites that we can't compare. Pay, <laughs> can't compete with. That's right. That's right. So if... And what's what makes it even stronger, even stronger, if you really think like you're more of a schlub, you right. will identify even more with that underdog. Mm. So if you're really, if you are like, I never, ever work out and I intend to never work out, right. then somebody like Akiseyama is going to be like, oh, that's my guy. I love you. Well, that's why like, I if you see like, love a, you. like a short basketball player or short professional yes. tennis player, everyone's yes. like, oh, I want the short guy because he's my height. Yes. I want Spud Webb. Remember him? Uh, 1980s basketball reference. Nope. He could dunk, I think, better than like anybody. He was so exciting. But he was he was teens. He was, he was teens. teens. Yeah. We like our teens guys. In, in, a, in a world of giants. That's right. You can compete. That's exciting. Yes, exactly. The underdog story gives us hope, right? And if it's successful, that hope can really last a long time. So after we watch Rocky, after we watch The Karate Kid, after we watch Bridget Jones' Diary, <laughs> and we see that hero's journey from the lowest of the lows to the highest of the highs, we get to enjoy that feeling of success. And it's not short-lived. Like, studies prove that it lasts for days. Wow. It, days and days and days. Because we're like, oh, I could be that person. I could you be that person. You see yourself in them. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. 
Okay, another set of research researchers said, you know what? The reason we love underdogs is basically because we love schadenfreude. I'm sure many of you know that term. It is a term for feeling pleasure at someone else's misfortune. Yeah, pleasure in their pain. Yes. So the reason we love an underdog story is not particularly because we love the underdog, but because we love watching the other guy lose. We kind of resent people who are really, really good at things. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so, that's why I hate Tom Brady. And I don't hate Tom Brady, but like, we all like hating Tom Brady because he's so damn pretty and he's so damn talented. And then he, well, he until recently had a supermodel wife. I mean, yeah. like, it's really well, easy to hate Tom Brady and to I watch think him lose. This is why it was really easy for people to hate Hockahol. Right. Because he was so darn good at it. Yeah. And he, and he had like the confidence and the swagger that someone in that position really deserves. And I think it's why we all love Akimboshi. Right. We love, that's why the cushions fly. It's right. because we're like, oh my God, that short little guy just beat the unbeatable. And that is that sense of sh like schadenfreude. Oh, we love to watch that guy lose. We love to watch Tom Brady lose. I did really enjoy it when he did not make it into the playoffs. Yeah, I did too. And I was like, I'm sorry, Tom Brady, but, uh, but I'm not on your side right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. You have everything else going for you in well, life. Well, yes. And that leads to- But you us... know what? Tom Brady's just a regular guy too. He, he is. He cannot help he, how beautiful he is. Uh, well, see, talented. he's not really my style, but he is talented. Oh, yeah. He is talented. Okay. And he is tall. I'll give him that. He is He's, tall. His teeth are a little bizarre to me. He has perfect teeth. Uh, exactly. They're a little too perfect. Oh, they're too perfect. They're too perfect well, and too what, white. And that's too... what big money buys you. Two perfect yeah, teeth. two perfect teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and a two perfect wife and two perfect kids. Exactly. And a two perfect career. I mean, the guy's like 87 and he's like just retired. <laughs> I mean- I think he's just retired. Okay, he's so there's a there's a couple reasons why we love the underdog. Here's another reason. We just want the world to be fair. We think everybody should have a chance to win. Justice should prevail. Like, no one should win all the time. And it's sort of... um the more we root for the underdog, the more it seems to support, you know, that idea, like, some things are just unfair. And we don't... Right. We just don't like... We don't like things that aren't fair. There's... They did... A, Economists did a real interesting study about this. Um, they played a laboratory game called Ultimatum, and they they sat two people down, and there was a pool of money in between them. And mm -hmm. the first person says, hey, other person across from me, look at this pool of money. We should split it. Uh, how about we split it 60-40? I'll take 60, you take 40. What would be your response to that? Um no, why not even? Exactly. So the second <laughs> player would decide whether or not to accept that offer. But here's here's the little extra bit. If you turn it down, neither one of you gets any money. So if you turn it down, no one wins. Oh. more uh, Most often... People take the 40%. No. People turned it down oh, wow. because it was unfair. Depends on how broke you are. You'd be like, 40% is more than I had before. <laughs> So I don't care what he does with his extra twenty. So in in this in this experiment, it it showed you that people would rather just completely reject the offer because it's unfair. Yeah. They like the uneven reward is just like they just couldn't get to a point where they're comfortable with that. So they're like, great, neither one of us are going to get money because you are being stingy. You want to keep it all for yourself. So fine, I'm not going to let you have it because we live in a just world and it should be 50 50. So neither one of us are getting it. Okay. <laughs> I did get that. I could stand behind that too. I'd be like, I get that. Well, yep. no, neither of us will walk away from this. And we've learned a lesson that That's it's right. better to be fair. That is right. <laughs> right said that with is... that look on their face <laughs> it's so true it's better to be fair and maybe next time you will be fair exactly because you're not going to get any money out of this that's mm -mm -mm. right all right so another reason we all love the underdog story is empathy when we tap into qualities we like best about ourselves and find admirable in others it builds empathy like the underdog story it feels like they need us they need us to support them. It really rewards our our empathy <laughs> dendrites, right? We're like we're good people. We all do. We're all going to do this together. Ooh, it's all we're or social. nothing. That's right. It's all or nothing. Clear hot, clear eyes, full <laughs> heart. Can't lose. <laughs> I do envision myself like sometimes team last place. It's the American dream story. It is the rags to riches story, and it is peddled all over the place in our entertainment. It's our David and Goliath. It is such a universal story. We Americans love this American dream story. It's 
kind of in our DNA. Yeah. yeah but it, it was interesting for me to see that it's, it's in lots of other cultures as well. And uh, the final reason I found for the reason we love to support an underdog is basically it's way more emotionally satisfying if the underdog wins. Yeah. Right? We want the fight to be thrilling. We don't, it's not as much fun if we watch the big strong guy take the win well, easily. People start leaving the football stadium when the other little team gets trounced, you right. know? Like yeah. It's, it's 54, just not as much fun. And you're like, oh, yeah, people start heading to their cars. Exactly. It's just no fun. Exactly. We want it. We want it to mean more for us. And it does mean more for us emotionally if something happens that's not supposed to happen. The payoff is bigger. Um, it's it's kind of like if the underdog wins, it's like four times less likely, but 10 times more gratifying Yeah, is the quote I kept finding everywhere. Way more gratifying, way more exciting. And it's like we put our stock into that, which emotionally will give us more payoff, which makes perfect sense to me. And why we loved it so much when Tokushoryu won. Yes. The tournament and why we cheer on Atami Fuji and we still care. And even in the news this week, everyone's talking about Kirishima has picked Atami Fuji to spar with or whatever. Yeah. We're still on this storyline and we want it's, this kid, it's this why sweet I tomato, want, yes, it's to why rise to the top. I love Midori Fuji's wins. Every time he gets one of those amazing wins, it's four times, ten times as gratifying because he's the smaller guy. Yep. There you go. That is. My research for you today. Right. Why you might like the underdog. Exactly. Keep cheering on those underdogs. Yep. Thank you for listening. We will be back at you next week with who knows what. Whatever we pull out of our butts next week. That's right. <laughs> Until That's then, right. I'm Leslie. I'm Laurie. See y'all later. Bye. Bye.